everybody. We're now going to we're going live, and uh, welcome to the Women in Politics, the new conversation, uh, which is a webinar where we will be talking to a number of um, a number of politicians uh, from various uh, states in Australia. In particular, we have four politicians. I will be um, Senator Amanda Stoker from Queensland uh, in the federal parliament, the Honourable Claire Scriven in South Australia. Tanya Davies, MP in New South Wales, and Dr. Catherine Cumming from, from Victoria. And I'll say more about you individually as, uh, as we get closer to the, um, to the webinar. What I'd like to do at the moment is, um, if you can just be, bear with me, what we've got is um, our sponsor has always been Christian Vision Media, and they've been very supportive of the work that we do here at Family Voice. The, uh, the host, of course, is myself, Greg Bond. I'm the national webinar host and also New South Wales State Director and the Australian Capital, Capital Territory State Director as well. Uh, David DeLima is our South Australian Northern Territory State Director and David will be supporting me as assistant host. So we're looking forward to that. Um, may I just say to you that um, our next webinar will be Ethical Christian Investing with Alex Cook. And I invite everybody to look at that and make sure you register uh, on next Monday for the 26th of April. And that will be a really interesting one because uh, with uh, the aging population and providing for your family, that'll be an interesting webinar. Okay, if I may, what we've got is four wonderful speakers and Amanda, um, I think she's trying to ring me now, but um, what we'll have to do is uh, Amanda Stoker will come on board in a shortly and I'm going to introduce David DeLeva now to open up in prayer if you don't mind and then um, we'll go straight into it and our first speaker will be the Honourable Claire Scriven. David would you just say a few words and open in prayer? I will indeed Greg thank and you. thank you so much to all our participants. I should just point out at this stage that if questions come to your mind please start sending them in as soon as they come to your mind and then we will see if we can get through as many of those as possible. But we give thanks for the four parliamentarians who have made time in their important schedules and possibly even giving up some family time to be with us and we really appreciate that. We do give thanks for the way in which God has led his people through the role of women throughout history. And in scripture, of course, we think about Deborah who led Israel when there was a lack of leadership. She really stepped up. And we think about Queen Esther, who provided godly leadership over the pagan Persian empire and delivered God's people very wonderfully. And then there's also the unnamed mother of King Lemuel. And this is in Proverbs 31. The mother of King Lemuel, who taught her son that he should avoid immorality, but speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves and I really want to pay tribute, especially to Claire Scriven, uh, who I, I have been uh, working with closely in, in relation to a number of matters here in South Australia. Regrettably, we seem to be losing battles, but I, I want to pay tribute to you, Claire, for speaking up for those who cannot speak for themselves. So uh, following the good advice of the mother of King Lemuel, let's pray as we get into our webinar tonight. Our Father, we thank you that you have made mankind male and female. You've given us different strengths and different abilities, and we complement each other, even though we live in a culture which is denying any gender difference. We rejoice in your gift of diversity between male and female. And I thank you for these four parliamentarians who will be guiding us tonight and giving us the benefit of their wisdom. Strengthen them in their roles and be with them as they go about very important work uh, defending what is good and right in our parliaments. So be with us tonight as we hear from them and we look forward to hearing what they've got to share. So be with us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, David. I've just got a message from Amanda Stoke as she's trying to resolve some technical issues. Look, I have the pleasure of introducing the Honourable Claire Scriven, MLC in South Australia, who is the Deputy Leader of the Opposition in the Legislative Council. She's the Shadow Minister for Regional Development, Shadow Minister for Primary Industries and Shadow Minister for Forestry. Uh, Claire, I'd like to hand over to you for about 10 minutes to talk about the issues and then we'll have questions at the end when all the speakers have um, made a presentation. Thank you, Claire. Uh, thank you, Greg. And I'd also like to acknowledge 
acknowledge my fellow parliamentarians uh, here tonight and all of the viewers, thank you for joining us. And I'm sure we've got a diversity of um, both political views and religious views, uh, but it's good to be able to come together and just talk to people who are interested in the role of uh, Parliament and be able to share uh, what some of our thoughts and perhaps personal journeys are. Just a little bit of background. Uh, I'm in South Australia. I'm a member of the Legislative Council, as Greg said, and I was elected in 2018. So relatively new in South Australia, that's an eight year term. So I've still got five years to go for better or for worse. Uh, and of course, then I might stand again if I'm able to get free to election. So some of the questions or topics that uh, we were invited to reflect on tonight uh, involve uh, a number of things. So I'll perhaps address a couple of those and then um, happy to uh, take questions at the end of the entire session. So one of the questions is, is there a challenge between politics and family, and I think it's probably a bit of a no-brainer to say, yes, there certainly is. It can be very, very difficult. And I think that's the same both for uh, male parliamentarians and female parliamentarians. Uh, the difference being, of course, if, as women, we, uh, we actually have the, the babies. Uh, I've had six, so I've got six children, and it has certainly been an interesting journey. Uh, I, was in, I was actually had the opportunity to go into parliament when I was in my late 20s, and I had uh, one child at the time who was only a few weeks old, uh, and I chose to decline that offer. Um, it was, uh, yes, that's, it's unusual, let's put it that way, when you're offered a, a safe seat in the upper house, uh, it's very unusual to turn that down. But uh, it just didn't seem to be what I wanted to, uh, how I wanted to live my life at that time. And I was told, well, you know, these chances only come once, and I fully accepted that, and I had no regrets to say, well, no, this is not what we want to be doing at this time. Um, but of course, that proved to be wrong things do, they sometimes have uh, a second opportunity. Uh, and so after having moved away from politics entirely for a period of time, having my six children, uh, doing a number of things, running my own business, working in the public sector, working in the private sector, uh, I then felt called to get back involved. And at that time, the youngest of my six children was two. By the time I was actually uh, elected in 2018, she was, uh, she was eight. And I think one of the things that has been a real blessing to me is the fact that I have a very strong husband who was willing and able to be uh, home full time. So uh, as well as having six children, we homeschool them and always have. Uh, the oldest ones have you know, gone to university now, they're often married and um, are doing all sorts of things. And uh, the middle ones are uh, some are in the workforce and some have just finished school. Uh, my son, he says he's having a gap here. I'm not quite sure what he's having a gap from because he doesn't actually intend to go on further study, but that's okay. He will work out what that is. Um, but my husband was willing to be uh, home full time, he's willing to take over the homeschooling, which is something that we'd shared in and out of the workforce over the last sort of 25 years. So that makes a real difference because it is difficult. It's very hard to be away from family. Uh, I'm a regional MP, so I have to come to Adelaide uh, every week as a shadow minister. So that's a lot of time away from family, but because of our circumstances, sometimes the family can travel with me, which does make a difference. Um, but it is difficult. There's always an opportunity cost for anything that we do. And that is the same when we're having, um, you know, having time in, in this case, um, a career in parliament, uh, but also uh, when we're having time out of the workforce to raise children, if that's what we choose to do. In terms of how we address that, uh, I think one of the biggest ways is one, knowing what our core priorities are, and I say our because um, my husband and I see this as a, a joint endeavour. It's something that we're in together, and the family, of course, then is in together as well. Um, so one of the things we do is know what our core priorities are, what it is we're trying to achieve. And the other is we talk to the children, particularly younger children, about why it is I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, why is mum away so much? Not just because mum's off pursuing a career, but because of the core motivations about why I went into politics in the first place. So, you know, I talk with them about, you know, we want to try and make the world a better place. Um, and what that means on an individual level is actually having better laws that shape our, our communities uh, and better opportunities for everyone. And we've had, um, I, I remind the children that ones who are old enough to remember of some of the hardships that we've had in the past when we were a single income family and my husband was self-employed and it was feast and famine. And I remind them about the opportunity that we've got and how I guess uh, fortunate we are now to explain to them that this is as much, uh, you know, in many ways, about helping other families and other children and other people who don't necessarily have the same opportunities. And that sort of comes back to my core values as a Labor politician. 
about helping those who have disadvantages and helping people to be able to realise their opportunities. One of the other issues that was posed was whether Christians should be politicians. And I would frame the question, well, should Parliament represent the diversity of the electorate? And I think, of course, it should. Uh, there are people in the community who are Christian, so it's entirely reasonable that there are people in the Parliament who are Christian. Um, I think one of the other questions which perhaps is, is not framed in that is, should Christians be involved in political parties in other ways? So I think, frankly, I think it's a bit of a no-brainer that yes, Christians should be in Parliament because they represent part of the community. But also I think it's really important that um, uh, members of, of groups, including you know, Family Voice, should be active in the political parties themselves. Because often the makeup of uh, political parties, rank and file memberships sort of everyday members who uh, just go along to a meeting perhaps you know, once a month or once a year or help out at election time are not necessarily representative of the electorate. Uh, often people join for one particular reason. Uh, and we've seen that people join uh, often to push a particular barrow that perhaps is not consistent with my view of what is good for our community and good for our society. Uh, but they have been very active in the political parties. And what that can lead to is a kind of a single narrative, dominant narrative that everyone thinks that uh, this party thinks this way or this party thinks that way. And even within the parties, that narrative can become the only, only narrative. So we need to make sure that there are people in the parties who represent a diversity of views. Uh, and when it comes to Christian values, for me, they're really consistent with my Labor values. Um, they're, uh, the ALP, of course, was founded by working class Catholics and working class Protestants in the 1890s. And you know, God and faith was just a natural part of a lot of their lives. Um, the anti-communist movement in the 20th century, of course, was um, very strong within the ALP, and we won't go into a history of, uh, of where that led, to, led us. But in terms of our, my general philosophy, I think it's really consistent, both my labour values and my Christian values, because if we use the Christian terms, we say, well, love thy neighbour. And if I use the labour values, I say, well, care for the disadvantaged, look after the vulnerable, make sure there's a social safety net. Um, uh, you know, a Christian might say that we're called to be stewards of the earth, uh, in the ALP, I talk about you know, caring for future generations, being responsible for the earth, for the environment, not having rampant consumerism. I think they're, uh, they're consistent both uh, Labor values and Christian values. And then the basic tenets that Labor stands on is things like fairness, that people are created uh, equal in their entitlement to dignity and respect and should have an equal chance to achieve their potential. So again, a lot of what we talk about as basic foundational principles are entirely consistent with Christian values. Uh, things like compassion and individual freedom, responsibility, democracy and community. How am I going for time? I've got a few more things. Uh, to yeah, a couple of more minutes and then we'll move on, then we'll come back to you, Claire, thank All you. All good. So uh, another question was whether there should be more women in Parliament. And I think absolutely there needs to be, but they need to be reflective of all of society. They need to have various backgrounds, not just be, for example, middle class career women. Um, the diversity of opinion has to reflect the diversity of all of the electorate. Uh, and, and if we don't have women of all different backgrounds, again, the only female voices we hear sometimes are those that are not necessarily reflective of, uh, of all women in our society. Uh, and that, yeah, that can go the same for all sorts of backgrounds. I mean, we don't have very many Indigenous women in. Uh, in our parliaments either, or very many multicultural women, other cultures. So uh, it, we can apply the same principles to a lot of things, but I think we need to ensure that we don't think that there is one way of being a female parliamentarian and that that means uh, that you're for X, Y or Z or you're against A, B or C. It's really about making sure that we have diversity and that includes, of course, uh, Christian women in yep. parliament. And it's interesting because in general, and I'm generalising here, um, women are very community minded. We have huge amounts of women involved in you know, volunteering in local government, uh, in all sorts of, if you like, grassroots community organisations. They're often the ones doing you know, the fundraising at the, at the sports club or uh, organising things at schools or whatever it might be. There's a huge diversity of things, as well as you know, running their own businesses, startups, and entrepreneurs. But a lot of women don't see that kind of involvement as being relevant to state or federal politics we still have uh, far fewer women getting involved in those levels of government 
compared to, uh, to local government. So we need to really think about why, why it is, and I think that's perhaps just making a couple of things, making it clearer that all of those activities are directly related to mm. the things that are made in our home, vice versa, uh, and also that you know, we need to find ways to support women, particularly women with families, uh, to be able to be members of parliament and make sure that the structures around that are not, don't preclude them from it. Now, for me, it worked to you know, go into parliament when I was a little bit older, when my children were a bit older, uh, and that was a choice that worked for me. Um, but other women might not want to make a choice in that way, but I think we need to ensure that there are the structures around that enable those women to okay. be very involved so in our community and our homes will only benefit from it. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you. We'll come back to you. Can I introduce now Tanya Davies, MP in the New South Wales Parliament. She's a member of the Legislative Assembly, a member for Malgoa, and in 2017, Tanya was the Minister for Mental Health, Minister for Women and Minister for Ageing. Over to you, please, Tanya. Hmm. Oh, thank you very much, Greg, and also to David and my fellow uh, con contributors tonight. Lovely to meet you and thank you for your time. Um, good evening to everyone uh, listening to this podcast. I certainly hope that uh, you will glean uh, a lot of uh, advice and a lot of insight that will not only help you personally, but maybe help others in your network to chart um, a course for yourselves moving forward. Um, just briefly, a little bit about myself. Uh, I am up approaching a very significant milestone very soon uh, in my age. Uh, so I've had quite probably about 35 years of work experience um, from a teenager uh, in a whole range of areas from private enterprise, small business, tertiary education, um, TAFE education, um, local government uh, and also now state government. So I got into politics as a local councillor when I was 37 uh, and our first child was about 14 months old. Um, I got involved in politics because I, uh, having had my first child, I realised um, that the next generation that was going to live in my community was coming and I looked around at the state of the community here in Western Sydney and I could see there were significant failings that we that we needed to address uh, infrastructure that was uh, backlogged and hadn't been developed and and I just had a sense of I personally had to get involved in some way to make it better for the next generations to come that life uh, was no longer up to me and my husband um, this year of 25 years um, but we really had a responsibility to the next generation. And so what began as my only focus in local government, just working hard to fix issues in the local community, began to change into a bigger perspective about the state government. And there was one key issue for me in my community that was purely a state government responsibility and that as a local councillor, I was powerless to do anything to fix it. Uh, and that was a methadone clinic that was established in a local small business district. Uh, and um, everywhere I went, um, people wanted that to be addressed and that fixed. So that was, the, I guess, the seed in my mind for me to consider running for the state parliament. And the step from being a local councillor, which is pretty much part time, you can still hold down another job, um, versus being in the state parliament, which is more than a full time job, uh, particularly at the time uh, our daughter Laura was about two years of age. To me, that decision was a massive decision because it, it wasn't what I had in mind in terms of my desire to get involved in the community. Um, but my husband, who was already involved in politics, um, he, he really sat me down and sort of painted the landscape out for me clearly and said, you know, back in 2010 here in New South Wales, um, Claire, no... In that no disparaging um, comments to you in relation to Labor, but in New South Wales at the time, the Labor government who'd been in for 16 years was um, was really on the nose here in New South Wales. And, and I guess the, the, um, the sense of change was coming in terms of uh, the political leadership of New South Wales. So my husband said, look, if, you, if you're gonna consider running for state, it's now to, to get in the swing that's coming or it's never. So. I, I went for it and um, I, I was elected. I was successfully elected in 2011. 
Since then, I've been re-elected two more times. So I'm now, I just finished my 10th year as the member for Mogoa out here and uh, celebrated that 10th anniversary by looking around and seeing the substantial list of improvements that I know I've been involved in delivering for my community. Um, new schools, upgraded schools, air conditioning in Western Sydney, which is a key thing for our schools, roads, bigger hospitals, you name it, in the last 10 years, the transformation has been extraordinary. And so I, uh, I guess I began in politics and it's always been my perspective in politics is that I'm, I'm involved because of the community. Um, I never, ever have ever held a, a ambition for myself that I'm in this position because I want to get somewhere in life. It's always been, what does my community need and how can I fight to make that happen? So um, we had um, we had a, a second little boy. Uh, we had uh, At the time, our daughter Laura was nine and then um, we had Harry. And uh, so there's nine years between them. And up until that point, I was able to pretty much juggle the one child and working full time and my husband running his own business as a sole trader and also being in council as a local councillor. We're kind of doing the massive juggle, juggle, juggle. You know, we'd sit down and we'd look at our diaries and we'd work out, you know, who's dropping Laura off, who's picking her up. I need to go out at night. Can you make sure you take her here? And all of that organising, which all mums and dads need to do. And when Harry turned up, it was very exciting. Um, I was 45 years of age when Harry was born. And, um, and then three months later, uh, Mike Baird, as the Premier announced, he was um, retiring from being Premier. So we had a new Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, and she is, um, pulled together a new ministry. So Harry was four months of age when um, Premier Berejiklian asked me to become a minister. And, uh, and that was a time in my life that was almost like a blur. Um, I went from being a sleep deprived, older, as my, my obstetrician called me, geriatric mother, mm -hmm. because I was over 40. Um, sleep deprived mum with two children, um, being a minister responsible for portfolios, getting my head around dealing with the metro media in Sydney, budget estimates. We are also running up um, to an, a new election period of time. So electioneering, so all that together um, was an incredibly, um, well, testing time, I think you could call it. Um, and there are a couple of things that I did during that time to, I guess, to get through it reasonably in one piece. Um, and that was to make sure I surrounded myself with people that could support me. So I, I really wanted to to be an example for others that you can take on challenges um, as a woman, even with a young family, but you've got to be wise about it. You've got to put in place those support networks, delegate where possible, identify where you are personally needing some time out um, to recharge and to refresh and make sure you do that because if, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Um, and so various things I put in, and a lot of it was trial and error as I went along in that two-year period. But I want to say to answer one of the questions, you know, should there be more women in politics? Absolutely. Because we, as women, we actually have, we have a different perspective on life. We see things differently. We also have a different, I guess, a different temperature to measure um, the issues that people are experiencing. And so uh, one of the things that, that I contributed to our discussion when we were looking at electioneering in the 2019 election was in my area as Minister for Mental Health and Women, the issue of postnatal depression was an issue that was still very difficult to talk about. Um, but in that role, I had the opportunity to hear firsthand people's experience and also to think about well, what can I do, what can I um, help lead change in. And so as a result of, of that work I did, we introduced the baby bundle. Um, and so now from the 1st of January of 2019, um, every, every mum that gives birth to a baby um, gets a $350 free baby bundle, beautiful bag, beautiful um, things for a child. 
But amongst that gift is information about postnatal depression for the mum and the father, how to go about getting help. Because a lot of the time people feel very um, embarrassed about it and ashamed that they're feeling this way. Um, and so we're trying to break down those barriers. So because as I was a new mum uh, in uh, recently and my particularly my journey to try and even get to having a second child, I was very transparent with that journey wherever I went because I wanted to show people out in the community that, yes, I may be a minister, I may have a title, but I'm just normal. I'm just like every other woman out there. And, and we have to be transparent about our lives to, to show women that it's okay to be honest and we have to be honest if we're going to help each other and, and come around each other when we're struggling. So I was, I was proud of what I was able to deliver after my time um, as being a minister, but I also knew that, that with Harry, he needed some extra help with speech therapy and I hadn't yet had a chance to even toilet train him and he was, you know, approaching two years of age and I just thought I just need to call some time out in my career. So I, I willingly stepped down from being a minister after the last election because I recognised within myself and I recognised within my family that the pace that I was running as a minister was not sustainable in the long run and I, I willingly stepped back and became a backbencher just so that I could get a few things in place in my own family. And, um, and I, other than missing the opportunity to make change across the state as a minister, I, I do not regret that decision whatsoever. And, and I know that my family is well and Harry's doing well and we're, we're healthy, you know, emotionally healthy as a family unit. And that really is a number one priority. Um, should there be more women in politics? Absolutely. And I completely agree with Claire. We need, we need a, a, a diverse range of women and men in politics because we do need to represent the community. We need the perspectives. We need the experiences. We need the knowledge that different sectors of our community bring into the mix in, in Parliament. Um, that was my timer, so I wouldn't go over time. <laughs> Um, so I think just in closing, um, are there challenges for women in politics versus men? Yes, absolutely. But I do know that if you're if you're wise and if you're smart, then you can put structures in place that actually help you um, do your role as a mother, a wife, a daughter, a woman, and a politician, and and do it well. Thank you, Tanya. That. Um wonderful and um, we'll come back to both of you in a moment. I'd like to introduce now Dr Catherine Cumming, MP, MLC in the Victorian Parliament. She is independent in the Legislative Council representing the electorate of Western Metropolitan Region and currently sits on the Environment and Planning Committee. Welcome um, Catherine, over to you. Uh, thank you Tanya and Claire and it's lovely to meet you both. Um, it's quite interesting that we, we even though we've just met tonight, we're all quite similar. Um, in, and I'll, I'll explain my story, I guess. So um, I, I come from a family who are very community minded. Um, I, I live in west of Melbourne in a very uh, diverse and quite a vulnerable community in lots of ways with lots of infrastructure problems and, and just lots of um, socioeconomic issues. I, um, from my family being very community minded, um, in my final year of uni, I decided to run for local government. Um, I was studying Chinese medicine at the time, and I thought act locally, think globally. Um, and I ran for my local council as an independent in a very labour dominated area. I didn't really know much about politics. I probably voted once before. I didn't even know uh, what left or right was. <laughs> Um, or red or blue. Um, I chose red. And, I, I chose red. And, I think. I think my my literature was blue and white. And someone called me a liberal, and I had no idea. I thought I was just choosing bulldog colours for the local football team. Um, and I got on in the age of twenty three. And I was because I grew up in my own area. I, I knew my area very well and what was needed. Um, I locked on door knocked to find out exactly what my community wanted. Um, and I absolutely loved it, um, the, the challenge of local government. So I spent 
uh, 20 years, 21 years on local government uh, as an independent. Um, and I must say the challenges in local government, one being a woman or um, as well as being, I've had all my children on council when I was on council. So I became a mother when I was 27 with my first child. I have five children, <laughs> five children, all on council, and they all they all only knew my mummy goes to meetings, and when they played games, they actually put their plastic phone in their bag and packed to go to a meeting. And that's all they knew that that's what mummy did. Um, and and I, I must say, like the challenges in local government as a woman, um, a lot of I being being there for seven elections, seven, seven terms, a lot of women were lucky to run again. They would, they would spend their first term, four years, um, and they would be lucky to run again. <clears throat> I was very lucky, but when I first ran for council, I was single. I, I became pregnant with my first child and had my first child. And my CEO at the time, and I wasn't gonna run again. Like most women don't do that in the second term. And my CEO said um, to me um, that, that she, even with a small baby, they would do anything to make sure that I could run again. Put a microwave in the kitchen, put fruit in the fridge. Um, please don't feel that because you've got a, a, an infant, uh, please don't not run again. And just hearing that, um, I put my name down again. <laughs> Um, so yeah, but, um, and then I was very small supportive of any other woman that came onto council, young women, or even, even the men who had small children. Um, and I, I saw how difficult it was for my other male colleagues, uh, juggling small children and their family. Uh, you don't know what time you're going to finish meetings. It was a, quite a challenge. Um, I saw people get divorced because of it. Um, it was a strain on the family, uh, and I and I and I could see that, um, and I, I, I witnessed that uh, a quite quite a number of times over the terms that I sat through. I um, I because I sat on a very labour dominated council um, in in two thousand. My when my son turned four, um, my my husband had a breakdown. Um, he was diagnosed with being bipolar. When he was four, his mother died in a car accident and it just triggered something in him. So I had three small children um, and then my, my husband was diagnosed with being bipolar. Uh, we, uh, we ended up getting divorced while I was on council um, and that was quite a challenge at that time. I repartnered um, and then in and then I was happily repartnered and then went through domestic violence um, while I was on council in 2012. And I was on council for 16 years at that point and council elections were coming up again. <laughs> and I thought, oh, at lowest point of my life, I'm not going to run. I put my name down. Um, I'd never been mayor um, because I sat on a very political labor dominated council. Um, and got uh, re-elected with an independent council and they made me mayor. Made me mayor. <laughs> I was single, five children. Um, my youngest, my, my five children were one at the time. And I had to put my two small children into childcare for the first time. The three older children, uh, when they were growing up, apart from mummy being on council and running a Chinese medicine clinic, and running a cafe at the time, because as a councillor, you, you uh, don't get a full-time wage, you, it's a part-time wage. Um, and I juggled all of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I became the mayor. Uh, single, uh, five children, and had to put two, two of my small children into uh, childcare. Um, and I found that the most difficult bit. Um, you know, screaming baby, and all, all mothers who are working mothers, experience that even if you're leaving your child with your husband to go to a council meeting or to parliament it's always difficult if they're sick um, if they um, you know for whatever reason they, they want your attention 
but um, I had to work. Um, and being and having the opportunity of being the mayor um, when I sat on council for 16 years was probably it was a dream come true. Um, and my children absolutely loved the time that I was mayor. Um, I, I think my my son, who was turned three at the time, saw a picture of me on the front page of the paper and said, "Look, the mayor." And I said, "No, that's mummy." <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was beautiful um, to actually see um, my children actually acknowledge and allow me to always go to those meetings every night. Um, and it, it, the meetings at night were no problem. It was just the childcare when I became a full time worker at that time. Um, and then, like yourself, Tanya, um, sitting in the local government for many years, it's it's quite wonderful what you achieve in local government. You can see. Um, your hard work, the trees being planted, the grass being cut, how wonderful, you, you know, you, you contribute almost immediately. But there are always uh, issues that you know that you can't fix locally that you need, um, to, the state needs to step in or federally, somebody needs to step in. And I ran um, for state, I ran state in the lower seats um, and I say and I, hope, I say it for shits and giggles <laughs> when I was um because I knew I couldn't win in the lower seats as an independent but I wanted to bring up uh, three or five topics that were really um, important to my community and I just saw it as my um, my community service to actually bring those topics up to put it up to the Liberal or the Labor Party to say these need to be election promises for, on behalf of my community. Yeah. And then 2018, I decided, um, and I knew after, I feel like I did my apprenticeship in politics. I knew that I, if I wanted to really get into state, I would have to run for the upper house um, to have a chance to get in as an independent. And uh, I finally got the courage to do that, which was covering 150 boots, um, which was a daunting task to get them um, you know, manned. Um, and also to put up my own money to run my own campaign, um, knowing that you're, you're backing yourself and you could be losing that money. Because mm. um, if, if the community doesn't want you, um, you, you won't get in. Um, as simple as that as an independent. Uh, but I did, I got in. Um, so I've enjoyed the last two years. Um, I'm very lucky in the way that Parliament, um, the Victorian Parliament where I live in Western Suburbs is probably 20 minutes away from home. So I get to take my children to school in the morning and then sit in traffic for about an hour, <laughs> bumper bumper traffic to um, get, get to Parliament just on time before they say the Lord's Prayer, <laughs> um, which is quite lovely. Um, and it was nice that you started the, the tonight with the prayer as well. I almost felt like I was in Parliament. <laughs> local government, it was funny, when I first got onto local government, they used to have the Lord's Prayer. And when it, from the amalgamation, they dropped the Lord's Prayer and we had a non-dominational prayer that we kept in the drawer only for um, what we would consider if there was a, a disaster or sorts that we could pull it out and read it if we wanted to. Um, because of our community being, being so diverse. Um, but um, we, we always have, a, we've got a debate almost in our parliament at the moment about keeping the Lord's Prayer, um, historically or otherwise, or if we should go towards a non-dominational prayer. But we also have parliamentarians who have no faith that can, that can sit outside while the Lord's Prayer is being read. So people have that choice. Um, they don't have to sit there and listen to the Lord's Prayer if they don't want. They can sit outside the, the Parliament, the Chambers, and come in for um, uh, Welcome to Country. So uh, should should people who have diverse or a, a belief system um, be in politics? Um, of course, we need to reflect our community. I would say that I'm a, <laughs> a, a Taoist Catholic from my Chinese um, understanding. Um, as well as um, um, being lucky, I'm the youngest of six children. My mother actually sent me, could afford to send me to Catholic school. Um, my, my mother was a Catholic, my father was a Protestant. None of us were baptised. We were all told to pick our own religion as we got older. And I seem to have kept my Catholic 
Taoist um, faith. So I believe that um, there's a universal energy that connects us all. If you want to call it God or Allah or Buddha or who, or she or he or she, um, but there is something that connects us all because we feel it even in a time of COVID or a disaster or floods in New South Wales. Here in Melbourne, we feel it. We, we, we feel, we feel what, what's happening for you guys um, and we feel what's happening all over the world. So, mm. so I, I call that, that my, that's my faith. And I, and I feel um, the burden even with COVID from what's being in, in parliament. Um, I, 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 it's, it's felt very heavy for me in the last 12 months or 18 months now. Um, being that um, you, you can't not feel hurt when you know people are losing their businesses and people have died and only 10 people could have attended a funeral and knowing that um, when people have passed away of COVID that they haven't had their family members around them. And it's, it's, it, it, it definitely, um, it's been a challenging time. Um, but I, I do rely a lot on my faith, my faith in humanity, my faith in my community, that how they've drawn together and worked so hard. My Vietnamese community came straight out and started um, sewing up masks um, so everyone could have one if they couldn't afford them. Mm. Um, my African and, and um, other communities came out with the lockdowns to make sure that the, a lot of my community were fed. Um, and we're getting meals when the, the towers were locked down. And there's, and that, and I guess um, those, that's when I know um, that um, I, I have some faith <laughs> in, in being a politician. I've, I've had many challenges since being, local government and state government are almost completely different um, mm. in the way of making laws. Um, Yes, I read a lot of briefings in, in council and, and it's such a diverse um, mm. range of topics that you have to get your head around, just like state parliament. But um, making laws and knowing that those laws um, are for future generations, um, okay. it's quite um, solemn. I, I, I've, I've been brought to tears more times in the last 12 months um, in that chamber listening to heartfelt stories from other members of parliament, mm. Mm. Um, from community members calling and, and explaining um, you know, how they've had the challenges through COVID, but also mm. when, we, when we're actually um, um, making decisions on, the, on pieces of legislation and how they directly affect them, um, you cannot not be not, not moved um, mm. by it. Um, and yeah, um, uh, and yeah, I, I, I must say that um, in even these challenging times at the moment, um, yes, um, okay. I didn't realise I was a feminist or even, you know, I really <laughs> didn't think too much about being a woman over my years. Um, Catherine, we'll get to that in a moment if I could, it, yeah. It's quite, it's, it's, yeah. it's quite amazing, yeah. um, the, uh, even with legislation, the way that even the uh, the community conversation at the moment. Mm. Um, it, yep. It's quite interesting um, to be part of it at this time. Thank you. What we'll do, Catherine, now, thank you for that. Um, I've got some questions to go. Unfortunately, um, Queensland has gone into shutdown again by the looks of it because mm. um, Amanda cannot get through, so uh, the Palaszczuk government must have put a, <laughs> a ban on getting here. I'm not sure what's happened. So um, Amanda's texted me on the email. Uh, texted me on my phone to say she cannot get through, so it's sad. Look, I have a one quick question to kick it off. David's then going to go into it. Could I ask you all three of you as politicians, and I want you to give, obviously it'll be a genuine answer, but there's a lot of talk about having more women represented in the corporate sector, in the political sector. Can I ask you, there's talk about having quotas of women in parliament. Can I get you to respond to that for me or should it be a quota system or the best person for the job? Claire, could I go to you first? Sure. Look, I, 
I've got to say, to start with, I don't think the way that the, the question's been framed is the way that I would like to see the question framed. So I've um, got to say, back when I was perhaps about 20, I thought that quotas were a bad idea. And I mm -hmm. thought, no, women should be getting there on merit. Uh, you know, quotas undermine that. That means that women who do get there, people think they got there just because mm. she was a woman. But there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, um, the, the general merit argument assumes that men get there on merit. And I've got to say, yeah. we really need to look at our parliaments and ask, can we say of every, every man in our state or federal parliaments that they are all the best of the best that our country or state has to offer? And I think most people would acknowledge that, no, you can't say that about every man in our parliament. Mm -hmm. So that begs the question, well, how did they get there? They didn't yep. necessarily get there on merit, merit being such a subjective term in any case. Yep. Uh, so what that means is that they got there because of other reasons. And some of those reasons in some of those situations is because they were white middle class men or other reasons. Um, so first of all, I think we need to stop suggesting that um, affirmative action or quotas is somehow undermining, undermining merit because we don't have merit at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, second thing I'd say, which was a change that came, you know, in my last 20 plus years since I was 20, 20 years old, is that the reason quotas are helpful is because it forces, in this case, we're talking about parties, it forces mm. the parties to look for good women. Mm. Otherwise, they tend to look for more of the same. Those who are in the positions of uh, influence will tend, and this is the same in the corporate world in, uh, in, in many, many different sectors, will tend to see that those who are like themselves have merit. Mm. So quotas force the organisations, whether it's corporate or political, to go and look for good, competent women. And when they look, they find them. So I think that quotas is actually important until we get to a stage where there isn't that same uh, separation of power, which says that, uh, you know, more, more like for like is, is what, it, what constitutes merit. Thank you. Um... Claire, I'll consider myself rebuked. I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tanya, a quick response, please, and then Catherine, quick, because I know David's got some very pertinent questions. Tanya? Mm. Um, thanks. Look, it's, um, it's certainly very topical. Uh, if I'll just have my focus on New South Wales. The New South Wales Liberal Party doesn't have quotas um, yet. We were the party that produced the first female elected Premier in this state, the first female Speaker. Um, the first female attorney general um, running the state. So there's a lot of achievements that we have uh, achieved in terms of political positions um, in the, the female side of the equation without quotas. Um, if you're looking at getting more women sitting on the benches of parliament, um, I personally don't subscribe to quotas, but I do recognise that there are some fundamental structural problems in the party establishment, how it runs pre-selections, um, let me talk about the big elephant in the room, factions and their role in terms of influencing who gets picked and who, who gets um, overlooked. So there are challenges that political parties have to face. Um, and unless we actually identify the core reasons, just talking about this um, popular topic isn't actually gonna address the, the real reasons why we're having these issues. Thank you, Tanya. And a quick response from you, Catherine. Uh, easy, Greg. It, it's definitely a party politic, party uh, issue um, when you're talking about quotas. Um, as an independent, obviously, I know that the community doesn't look at a ballot paper and they see 12 names and, and someone picks rights one to six for the men and then one the next six for, 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 for women or vice versa because they just vote for women or they just vote for men. That's just almost a ludicrous thing to mm. think. But when people look at ballot papers, they look for women and they look for men. Um, they actually look for the best person for the, the job, the best person who's going to represent their community, who's going to work hard and hard enough for their community, who actually will do the job. Um, and, yeah, of course, um, yeah, I think that's a real topic for, uh, for parties and, and, and their little mechanisms. But... Um, yeah, for my, my, myself, knowing the general populace, uh, we don't care what your parties do. We'll look at the ballot paper and who's in front of us, and that's what how we vote. Thank you very much, Catherine. David, over to you. You've had a chance to look at the questions. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you. Well, here's a curly question. I might <coughs> suggest uh, Tanya may tackle it. Uh, more than 100 years ago, an argument was being made that we can't have women parliamentarians because they might all gang up, as it were, and vote to prevent the men from going off to war. So, Tanya, do you think that there's... Do you think that there's merit in the concept of, okay, maybe we should ask Catherine. She's, yeah, um, I spent 10 years she, in the Army Reserves um, <laughs> as a medic, on top of, you know, all the other little things that I did. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> I find that pretty funny. <laughs> Back to Tanya. The, I think the, I think the, yes, well, well, Tanya may pick it up, but the, the intent in the question, I think, is that, um, or in the argument, is that uh, possibly women parliamentarians would minimise the possibility of war. Um, it, yeah. An interesting um, concept. Uh, certainly there is um, a lot of work that does go on behind the scenes, behind the headlines of newspapers or or TV shows or news clippings about the, the work that diplomacy uh, and the relationship building um, between countries and um, various regimes. But... Um, at, at the end of the day, certainly, um, I can only speak for myself that if my country uh, and therefore my children and my community was under every so any sovereign threat, um, if the only course of action was to defend that by having to go to war, then that is something that I would have to endorse because um, we have an incredible, we're about to um, commemorate Anzac Day on Sunday, and we have an incredible history of our men and women going out to defend the values and the freedoms of Australia. And in fact, um, Australia was invaded because uh, the Japanese, when they entered Kokoda, that at the time when they entered uh, the Kokoda Trail, that the Papua New Guinea was still under Australian jurisdiction. So Australia has been invaded by a foreign, foreign country. So first and foremost is the sovereignty and the protection of our nation. Mm. Thank you. And of course, uh, Sydney Harbour and Darwin were both attacked. Um, one of our participants, Michelle, she really commends oh, the homeschooling. David, sorry, could I get Claire's response to that, please, just yep. quickly? Mm. Yeah, I will just respond very quickly. But I think it's what that question raised for me is, do women think in a particular way and do men think in a particular mm. way? And I think that's perhaps the, the issue. There may be uh, traits that uh, are more predominant in men or more prominent in women, but I think it's a mistake to say, well, women will do this or, or women won't do that. And I think perhaps 100 years ago that point of view was more uh, more widespread, but okay. perhaps uh, is less so now. If, if people are people, individuals are individual, uh, mm. and that's that's why that, that particular proposition I don't think is so relevant today. David. So one of our participants, Michelle, she commends the homeschooling Screven family very <laughs> thoroughly. And it raises the question about the right to teach and train children at home. Would Claire like to say anything about that? Um, well, I think we're very fortunate in Australia in that we are encouraged to uh, have involvement and choice about how we educate our children. Um, I know it's slightly different in each state as to what kinds of things are put around homeschooling, but in the same way uh, that you know we're able to choose whether we send our children to a, a government school or to a um, private school or to a Catholic school or to a home school is one of those choices which uh, I think each family needs to make based on their own needs, their own values, uh, and what it is that they're seeking for their children. Thank you. A uh, question for Catherine. Is there a female role model who has really shaped your political views and social conscience? I would have to say my mother. My 88-year-old mother would probably be my strongest. Um, yeah, my, my, who, who shaped my determination for my community. Or, or just she, um, My mother used to sell second-hand furniture. And um, I don't know, she would have, I think she gave away a lot of furniture to anybody who came and or she went to their home and she could see that they were in need. Um, or if I came home from school and I would say, um, I could see a particular family struggling. Yeah, she would actually go around and, you know, turn up with a, with a, with a bed or a couch or a, so w w witnessing that as a small child um, definitely shaped my views 
wasn't about the money for my mother. It was more about making sure that everybody was looked after. And I always felt that I was lucky. Thank you. A uh, question for Tanya. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, when she went into Parliament, thought that no woman would be Prime Minister in her lifetime. And of course, she went on to become Prime Minister on more than one occasion. So the question, can we expect a woman PM in your lifetime, Tanya? <laughs> uh, we, we did have one. I, I, have I misunderstood Julia. the question? Yeah. No. Uh, yes, that's true. The question, yes, has caught me by surprise, hasn't right. it? So, uh, well, like to, I, I David, the, you've got a short I, memory. I think, no, that, <laughs> no I, I'm misunderstanding. The um, I think the question is really getting at the the way in which Margaret Thatcher was surprised that there was a woman PM in her in her lifetime, and it was mm. uh, well, it, obviously it was her, but the yeah she. She did not expect a woman PM in her lifetime, and yet that's exactly what happened. I think that's what the question's about. Mm. I think so that, more the, of a... the struggle has always been people were very judgmental, you know, uh, rather than being judgmental in the way of can a woman do the job? Of course. Um, can that man do yeah. the job? Of course. Okay. Um, I think are they single or have they got, you know, whatever their challenges are? Uh, but, most people will rise above their challenges and still able to, to do the job. Can I, I think uh, the only thing I might just add to that is yep. that in recent years, uh, our society, particularly our young people, are seeing an acceleration of the rise of women in a whole range of roles and, and um, jobs, uh, including politics, but also in terms of doctors, researchers, um, inventors, uh, people that... Um, I guess areas of society that we haven't predominantly seen a lot of women achieving in that's starting to happen more and more. So our young people, uh, it's it's very common. We now have female sports commentators on the news every night. You know, a couple of years ago that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. So the pace of women breaking into these new areas is only going to accelerate, and it's a matter of time until we have the second female PM leading our nation. Right. A very quick question. I just want a yes or no. It's going to be really hard. I hope you're ready. We seem to have, at the federal and the state level, a minister for women. Should we have a minister for men? Yes. 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 Claire, you're not going to commit. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, the reason that we have a minister for women is because there isn't the... <coughs> We, I, I don't believe, and obviously mm -hmm. most of our parliaments don't believe, that we currently have equality of opportunity. Right. Um, if there is a stage where we get to where there is that uh, equality of opportunity, then we might not need a minister for women because it's automatic that. Yeah. That so uh, I think it would not be appropriate to have uh, a minister for men because they're not as a... As a group, to the extent mm. that uh, <laughs> we're talking about one, about as one as one group, um, they're not disadvantaged as men. There are certainly individuals, certain sectors of the community uh, that are disadvantaged, but in general, are not. In the mm. I think the only thing I might add to that, Claire, um, and and I understand your perspective. I certainly do, and and women in general do have um, mm. a lot more challenges in certain areas, but. Mm. I think to have a minister for men, particularly to also help lead the change that we need to see in men's behaviour towards women, such as in the Correct. domestic file of violence and um, that that um, sexual harassment and the the numbers of of um, you know people men convicted of of heinous crimes, um, pedophilia, etc. There are certain areas um, that that men seem to be predominantly the perpetrators in, and I think if we could have the role of a minister for men to not only just talk about the areas that that need change but also to speak positively about the good role models about the great fathers we have about the great husbands we have about the great single men that we have to um to i guess to i don't know how else to say it but yeah to do all that yeah. was probably what i'd add I thank you very much for that. And I have Greg, to, and I would agree. Yeah. I would totally agree because there are there are individual challenges for men and women, um, and, and especially with suicide with men. 
um, and a lot of health issues that are really just male focused that mm. it would be great it would be great to see yeah focused yeah if I can, just a little bit of a tangent. Um, one of the things that we often asked about is the structural issues that will assist um, you know, women, for example, to be more involved in politics. And, and there are a number, but I won't go into those today. But one of those that, that I think would help is a better uh, appreciation of the roles that we have traditionally attributed to women. So the roles of uh, parenting, the roles of uh, physical caregiver. One of the things that I found as a woman with a, my husband being predominantly at home, and he's found this, and this really, to be honest, hasn't changed a great deal over the last mm. 20, 30 years, is that he is considered, um, you know, to be not working more, to be somehow lesser because he's not out in the workforce yeah. and having a mm. career. And women have experienced this for years. I mean, we even still hear people talking about, uh, you know, whenever someone says, oh, you know, a, a working woman, I, say, I usually say, look, all women are working. Um, <laughs> You know, whether they're at home predominantly or they're out in the paid workforce or women um, are working. Uh, yep. But it's around those roles, actually appreciating those caring roles, whether they're performed by a woman or a man, appreciating the importance of parenting and really active involvement in children's lives. I think uh, a better status for those roles mm. would actually assist uh, all of those people undertaking those roles, but it would also assist women who uh, want to go into, for example, yep. a political role uh, and have a partner who would be able to take on yeah. those Thank you, Claire. I can tell you that, that as a chaplain to men, uh, men do go through depression, suicide. Uh, in my chaplaincy work, I'm actually talking to a couple of politicians. So it is an issue. And I think that uh, not just from a, a sexual point of view, but I think, you know, Minister for Men or something like that eventually uh, could, could be a good thing. But I understand where all you ladies are coming from. We have come to the end of our time. I'd like to have David DeLima, just a quick comment and then close in prayer. And then I'll just share my screen as we do that. Thank you very much, David. Mm. Well, thanks, Greg. Uh, just to clarify that Margaret Thatcher question, uh, can we expect a woman liberal peer? Uh, so I guess the answer to that is yes. I really appreciate the way tonight, Greg, that we've been able to bring these ladies together. Mm. And um, I'm sorry, Amanda's not been able to join with us, but um, I think that's a tremendous outcome tonight, as well as the encouragement that's been shared. Mm. I'm mindful also of a statement by John Wesley, who said that I learned more about Christianity from my mother than from all the theologians in England. So all strength to the hands of women. I'm also mindful of uh, the passage I've mentioned already, Proverbs 31, the woman of noble character, she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. So with those thoughts in mind, uh, and I appreciate uh, Catherine particularly uh, commending the opening of our seminar with prayer and indeed that of Parliament. So perhaps I'll just paraphrase the prayer that's used to open mm. federal parliament each day and apply it to these ladies for, for whom we're so grateful. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouch safe thy blessing upon these women parliamentarians direct and prosper their deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people. Amen. Amen. Um, Claire, Tanya, Catherine, can I thank you on behalf of all our members nationally, uh, our board of directors, our governing board, and all our supporters. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, this will be a webinar that will be on YouTube. So um, feel free to go back and have a look. But uh, on behalf of everybody, may I thank you for joining us and I wish you good night. Thank you. Thank you. And nice meeting you, Claire and Tanya and David and Brett. You too. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Claire. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, lovely. Bye. Bye.